Great. Thanks very much, Anna. And thanks, thanks to Anna, Alice and Overcome very much for inviting me to talk this afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk to Overcome again. Um, so as you can see, this is clearly an artist's impression of Manchester. Uh, and you can tell that by the blue, almost cloudless sky and the fact that there are spaces in the car park, which uh, is virtually unheard of. Actually, what you can see here is the new Proton unit, which has been just uh, recently built and opened up at the Christie. And there's another unit in UCLH in London as well. Uh, in fact, this isn't a useful treatment for over, uh, ovarian cancer, but I just thought I'd highlight this building. Then there's a chemotherapy suite in the middle. And then on the right hand side is the uh, procedures unit and the wards lie behind, behind this uh, picture. So what we're talking about today is the treatment of blood vessel formation inside cancer, and in particular, uh, blood vessel formation in ovarian cancer and how we can target that using drugs that hit the blood vessels. And these drugs are called anti-angiogenic agents. Now, cancers have several ways of uh, forming uh, cancer, uh, uh, forming new blood vessels. And we're talking today about a process called angiogenesis. And so I'll just talk you through the ways that cancers secure a supply of oxygen and food to allow them to grow. So if you imagine this is the wall of a blood vessel and inside the wall, that wall is made up of what's called endothelial cells, which are cells like a pavement that line the inside of a blood vessel. And at some point signals emerge to make one of those cells start to multiply again in a, forming a tip that eventually forms a connection with other blood vessels and allows blood to throw, flow through it to provide oxygen and food and take away waste products from other uh, uh, blood vessels and other tumour deposits. And this is a process called angiogenesis, which is the process by which new blood vessels emerge from existing blood vessels. And this is a prominent throughout nearly every solid tumour uh, that develops uh, in the body. Now, if you think about it, new blood vessel formation in an adult is extremely unusual. So once we're formed as adults, we no longer grow, so that as there are no growing tissues, the need for new blood vessels is actually very much limited to a small number of situations. And in women, that is menstruation and embryo formation and growth of, of babies, and um, it, otherwise wound healing, which is the major uh, need for new blood vessels. Um, the, uh, so new blood vessel formation is really quite restricted in an adult. And so if you think about the blood vessels that are at the back of your body in the aorta, which is your major blood vessel, those blood vessel cells will be multi multiplying every three or four months. In a, cancer in a cancer situation, those blood vessel cells will be multiplying every three or four days. And so the biology is quite different in enabling us to really think about how we can start to target this process. So angiogenesis is the process that we're going to be talking about today, which is the formation of new blood vessels from existing blood vessels. But cancer has other ways of obtaining oxygen and nutrients, and one of these is called vessel co-option. And this occurs in melanoma uh, and in some um, cases of uh, breast cancer. So what, what happens there is if, if we remove those new blood vessels and stop them forming, we stop the angiogenesis process, tumor cells can still grow around existing blood vessels, and that's what's meant by vessel co-option, that cancer makes use of blood vessels that, is, that are pr already present to derive oxygen and nutrients from those um, existing blood vessels. The third type of system where um, a, a, blood, a tumor can derive oxygen and nutrients is by actually mimicking a blood vessel itself, so the tumor cells start to behave like um, endothelial cells and form tubes through which blood can flow. And we call this vascular mimicry. The tumour itself mimics a blood vessel in order to derive oxygen and nutrients itself. And we see this in melanoma. So there are a number of ways that tumours can uh, derive a blood supply. But we're going to talk today about angiogenesis. And this is a process by which a tumour which is small, just like this, a small microscopic tumour, it exceeds the ability to derive oxygen and nutrients from nearby blood vessels. And at that point, it suffers a lack of oxygen and starts to secrete a hormone known as VEGF or vascular endothelial growth factor, which is the hormone that makes endothelial cells, these lining cells, start to multiply. So a tumour changes from not having a blood supply and being very small like this to one that has a blood supply and, it, and that blood supply enables it to grow. Um, and the consequence also of having a blood supply is that those tumour cells can then get into the blood vessels and then start to spread elsewhere. So this process of new blood vessel formation is not only necessary for 
angiogenesis, it's also important for spreading the tumor, a process called metastasis as well. Now, here you can see on the right that um, the new blood vessel supply has allowed the tumor to grow. But on the left-hand side, you can see a tumor that doesn't need a blood supply because it's, it derives all the oxygen and nutrients it needs from nearby blood vessels. And in fact, all the clinical trials that have been done with anti-blood vessel drugs show that the anti-blood vessel drugs work on that side of the tumor, the tumor that has a blood supply, but in a setting where there's only tiny little dots or microscopic amounts of tumor, because that doesn't need its own blood supply, the anti-blood vessel drugs don't work in that sort of setting. And so when we treat early cancer, anti-blood vessel drugs are not helpful in early cancer. Say for instance, where a, a woman has had a breast, a small breast tumor removed and needs some extra chemotherapy to increase the chances of cure. We know that in that situation with tiny little groups of cells, then the anti-blood vessel treatment won't be helpful because there aren't any new blood vessels. It's so small at that point. Now in the 1970s, when Judah Folkman first developed this idea about trying to hit the blood vessels, his idea was that blood vessel formation is essential but I can show you on the left-hand side of this slide that you've already seen there are some escape strategies that, slide, that, that tumors have. He also argued that we would put the, the, the tumors to sleep and to some extent that's true, but it's, there are ways that nature has found to get around some of the breaks that we have on forming new blood vessels already and I'll go on to discuss this. He also said because um, all the other blood vessel cells in our bodies are only multiplying every few months, whereas these blood vessel cells are multiplying every few days, that we should be able to develop a specific treatment against those blood vessels and it will be safe. And again, the treatments are relatively specific, relatively safe, but they do have side effects, as some of you in the audience will know. And of course, nature does not require, does not rest, um, does, does not rely on just a single mechanism to make new blood vessels form. And therefore, there are escape mechanisms that, that allow tumors to escape uh, from drugs that block the EGF. So, um, as I said before, one of the um, drivers to um, uh, make a tumour develop a new blood vessel is shown in yellow on the left. And this is the, the three factors that make a, a tumour uh, develop a new blood vessel are a low oxygen concentration or a condition that we call hypoxia, either acid conditions or sometimes cancer genes as well. And there are other growth factors and other factors shown here in, the, in white that make the tumour uh, start to release a hormone called VEGF and this is like a hormone that, that spreads throughout uh, the local area of the tumour and then it reaches a blood vessel cell which is what this pink uh, line represents here and in the surface of that, of that endothelial cell in the membrane which is what we're showing here there's a protein which is called a receptor and the receptor binds to that hormone and sends a signal into the blood vessel cells that then cause blood vessel multiplication and this is how the process of angiogenesis or new blood vessel formation occurs. Now in a normal person's body the result of this process is to form a very nicely um, structured tube where all the cells, the endothelial cells, are all packed together very tightly and in an ordered way so that the structure of the blood vessels is, is uh, very coherent uh, and the, the, they carry oxygen and food to the tumors very efficiently and there's some support cells around as well but this structure is very um, well contained. In a tumour where things are less well organised and the, grow, the uh, uh, growth factors and the hormones are being released um, uh, or, uh, or, uh, in, in different places, uh, you can see that the structure of the blood vessels um, is more leaky. So you see um, the blood vessels are, are, are not stuck together properly and as a result of that, this leakage, uh, this is one of the reasons why patients with ovarian cancer develop ascites, which is fluid in their abdomens. These new blood vessels that are formed are leaky and they can leak fluid into the person's abdomen and actually drugs that block this hormone, block VGF, reverse this process of badly structured blood vessels back to this sort of structure and can actually help treat patients. It's not something that we do commonly, um, but nevertheless we know that this is a contributing factor to why patients develop ascites or fluid in the, in the abdomen. So, so far what I've said is that um, blood vessel formation is dependent on a hormone called VEGF, which is released by tumors once they suffer a lack of oxygen and food. Now let's go back to uh, the ovary. And just to remind you about what we're talking about here, I hesitate to show this to the, uh, 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 the audience in Overcome, as you'll know this very well, but the ovaries are oval organs that are attached to the uterus, shown here, as a, which is the pear-shaped organ in the middle here, through a ligament and also through the fallopian tube as well. And um, in uh, uh, 
uh, embryo formation, eggs are released and travel down the fallopian tube where they're fertilized and can implant on, in the endometrium. A couple of points that are quite important. This is nothing to do with today's talk, but I highlight this very often because when we see patients with ovarian cancer, many of them say to me, I had my swat, I had my smear, why didn't it pick up my ovarian cancer? And the answer is that the smear affects these areas here, the, the neck of the womb, it does not detect abnormal cells up here. And the second thing that's important is because you can see that uh, the ovaries are in, in the person's pelvis here, you can see why uh, ovarian cancer has attracted the reputation of being relatively silent in terms of its symptoms because growth can happen here and push all the normal organs out of the way without necessarily causing symptoms. But what we know and for our patients is the irritable bowel-like symptoms that our patients develop um, gets worse over three or four months. Uh, so that's different from irritable bowel, which, which comes and goes. And secondly, uh, if a nice uh, recommendation is that if a woman develops irritable bowel syndrome from the age of 50 or, or later, uh, then she needs, should have a CA125 measured. But actually, that's not the reason I'm showing you this slide. I wanted to remind you about the function of the ovary, which is to uh, pr uh, produce hormones and also produce um, eggs that can then be fertilized uh, down the fallopian tube. So here I show a cartoon of this ovary enlarged here, and you can see the typical phases that uh, egg development goes through. So the eggs form inside the ovary and form a follicle, which is this structure here containing fluid. This then matures up and eventually the egg is released to travel down the fallopian tube where it may be fertilized or it may be shed through menstruation. That structure then collapses down to form another hormonally active structure, uh, and then gradually over time that just settles back to scar tissue. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this whole process is critically dependent on this hormone that I've mentioned already, VEGF. And so the title of this slide is that ovarian physiology depends on VEGF. And so now we have two reasons why targeting this growth factor is a, re is a, is a useful uh, development for our uh, patients. Firstly, cancers need a blood supply for oxygen and nutrition. And, sec uh, and we've said that angiogenesis is dependent on VEGF. But in addition to that, ovarian physiology, as I've shown you above here, is critically dependent on VEGF. So now we have two reasons why targeting VEGF should be useful for our patients. So the question is whether it works. Is it a useful strategy for us? So how do we target VEGF in the clinic? Well, there are two principal ways that we do this. First of all, we do this through a, an antibody that you will know well, which is uh, bevacizumab. Um, and which uh, causes, um, uh, which binds very specifically to uh, VEGF. And uh, it, it's, it's so specific, this drug, Bevacizumab, that it has few side effects. But the problem is that it needs to be given on a regular basis uh, uh, through a drip. The other way of, treat, uh, of trying to uh, block the activity of VEGF is by taking a tablet of a drug that's a small drug that can diffuse into the person's body, get inside the blood vessel cells, and block the receptors from, from working. And it does this by mimicking uh, a, a, a molecule that transmits the signal inside the, uh, the patients, uh, inside our cells. But the problem with these, these drugs is they're very similar to many other molecules that are inside the cells. And so these drugs called sidirinib or sunitinib or pazopinib, there are many different sorts of them. Because they share commonality, common structure with many other um, uh, molecules, they, uh, they have a number of effects on different receptors and they have many more side effects. So these drugs, for instance, can cause diarrhea and tiredness and, 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 and anemia, um, uh, whereas this drug, the antibody, which is very specific, has very few side effects other than side effects that are specific to VGF inhibitors like blood pressure problems and proteinuria. So the advantage of an antibody is that it's very clean and it has relatively few side effects, but the disadvantage is it has to be given as a drip. On the other hand, uh, these molecules can be given by mouth, which is much more convenient for the patient, but actually they're more um, dirty in terms of their mechanism. They have many more side effects. And again, many of our patients, many of you only, will have tried these different drugs and know about the different side effects. Now, there are three parts to, uh, there are three sort of critical time points when we're treating women with advanced ovarian cancer. There's the first time that we give them any treatment at all, which is when we, when we carry out surgery, and give the patient platinum chemotherapy, potentially with VGF inhibitors as well. The illness sadly can come back in some of our patients. And at that point, it can be sensitive to platinum, what we call platinum sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer, 
or it may be resistant to platinum or become resistant to platinum. And it's these three different phases that we typically consider when we're trying to work out the best treatment for our patients. And in all these three different phases, there are a number of trials that have uh, gone on with VGF inhibitors. There's trials in the first line setting when a person is, is newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer, ICON-7 and, and the GOG218 study. There are trials in the recurrent setting when the illness is sensitive to platinum as shown here. And there are other trials that show that the illness um, uh, can be treated e with VGF inhibitors even when it's resistant to platinum. So all of these trials have a very similar structure. They ask patients to take part in the study and if they give consent to take part, they've been, the patients were randomly allocated to receive either chemotherapy, which is the standard treatment alone, or chemotherapy supplemented by a VGF inhibitor. And at the end of the chemotherapy, the patient can then continue on the VGF inhibitor afterwards, be it bevacizumab or be it one of these small molecule um, VGF inhibitors. And the short of it is that when we look at this, in all of these settings, all three, be it new patients, platinum uh, sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer or platinum resistant uh, recurrent ovarian cancer, in all of these settings, the addition of the VGF inhibitor postponed the return of the cancer. And in fact, in some settings, notably patients with high risk illness in the first line setting, and those with platinum resistant um, recurrence, it actually improved the outcome uh, for, for the patient. So these are important findings. What we're saying is that these drugs um, seem to work no matter what the platinum sensitivity of the illness is. And just to contrast this, what we know from our experience of PARP inhibitors so far is that roughly speaking, PARP inhibitors tend to work in platinum sensitive ovarian cancer. So in other words, towards this end of the, of the distribution of the clinical trials, whereas the VGF inhibitors have activity uh, throughout the uh, spectrum of, of platinum sensitivity that we see with our patients. So uh, it, it works in multiple different settings. But at the moment, in the first line setting, we in the UK, and in fact throughout the world, because there's an American trial that showed a very similar thing, we treat our patients in the UK based on a trial called ICON-7. And in ICON-7, patients um, were allocated to either receive chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy supplemented by bevacizumab, uh, the, the anti-VGF antibody. And then they were allowed to continue the VGF inhibitor. But here's the problem. The, the, the design of the study allowed, uh, allowed us to give bevacizumab for up to 12 months after the patient finished the treatment and then stop. And we're only giving it once. We're not giving it again despite those trials that subsequently emerged. So these are the two problems I'm now going to address. First of all, imagine a tumor that's shown in this picture here, and we stop new blood vessel formation for 12 months. We give a VGF inhibitor, we control it, we shrink it down because it's starved of oxygen and food and the tumor shrinks down nicely. But it's po quite possible that some tumor cells are left, but the breaks are on because we're stopping that tumor from forming any blood vessels. So if we're stopping new blood vessel formation, why would we stop it at 12 months? It doesn't make biological sense. It's not the same thing as with chemotherapy, where chemotherapy is a, if you like, it's a, a killing mechanism. It, it kills the cancer cells, but after a while, any cells that are left might develop resistance to that particular chemotherapy. On the other hand, these drugs are putting the brakes on. They're stopping a process that's not cancer cells, it's blood vessels. And at the end of 12 months, why would we stop? Now, it's not the UK that's specific, that's only st that stops at 12 months. In the US, they stop after 15 months, and that's because the American trial stopped after 15 months. It doesn't make biological sense, and we need to uh, uh, adapt to this and um, uh, develop the evidence to try and use these drugs in a more logical way. Secondly, uh, as I showed you on the, on the previous slide, we can use these drugs in multiple different settings, but until recently, we didn't know whether we could only use these drugs once. What we think we know for the PARP inhibitors is that once you've used a PARP inhibitor, because it has a, it's a, a PARP inhibitor is like a smart form of chemotherapy. So it looks like you may only be able to use those, those drugs once, at least not, uh, not reuse them without having uh, at least a decent break between using them. But these drugs, the, the VGF inhibitors appear to be active whether the illness is new, platinum sensitive recurrent or platinum resistant uh, recurrent. Is it logical to only give it once? And the answer is no. So let's go on now. Uh, in the last uh, year or so, and this is hopefully coming to, uh, to be published soon, a study called MITO16B was presented. And MITO16B is an Italian trial that said, can we offer women retreatment with bevacizumab, the anti-VGF antibody, and does it work? 
So here they took patients who'd had previous treatment for ovarian cancer, including bevacizumab. And then they said, let's, okay, let's allocate patients to ask the question, does it work again? Patients were allocated either to chemotherapy, which is the international standard of care, or chemotherapy plus bevacizumab again, followed by maintenance bevacizumab. And this trial again showed the same benefit again of adding a, a bevacizumab onto that trial. So what this is saying is that we can reuse these drugs and they work. So the first couple of slides I showed you showed that the drug works irrespective of whether the, il the illness is new or platinum sensitive or platinum resistant, but we didn't know whether we could use it more than once. This trial now shows that you can use it more than once. And by the way, this is also similar to findings that have been shown in ca colorectal cancer and bowel cancer as well. So we can reuse these drugs effectively. The question is, how are we going to do this? And so the work that we've been doing over the last um, 20 years, I'm embarrassed to say, can be summarized in one or two pictures, which I'm going to show you here. The problem with giving everybody drugs like this until recently is that they're expensive and they do have side effects. So uh, some of you will know that the bevacizumab can cause high blood pressure, can cause protein in your urine, it can cause occasional bowel damage or clots. Uh, and it's also expensive as well, but it was expensive until recently. And now that the uh, patent has expired on bevacizumab, and now that there are drugs called biosimilars, which are drugs that do the same thing, but are not exactly the same as bevacizumab, now that we have those drugs, the cost of this is going to come down and we need to start to use these drugs and push the NHS to allowing us to reuse these drugs in the same way that we do with carboplatin when we retreat patients with chemotherapy. We use the platinum drugs again because they, they work. So what we've been trying to do is work out well, which patients benefit. We could treat everybody, but that means there's a proportion of patients who won't benefit from, uh, give, from drugs such as bevacizumab. So over the last 20 years, we've been trying to work out who benefits from bevacizumab or not. And we've carried out a large number of investigations and identified a protein called TI2. And TI2 is a receptor for a different family of blood uh, vessel forming hormones. Uh, uh, which we can measure in the, in, the, in the patient's bloodstream. So we can measure this protein TI2. And what we've shown is that patients who are on chemotherapy, shown in the blue line, over time, they have no real change in the level of TI2 in their bloodstream. But patients who are on bevacizumab and where the bevacizumab is working, that TI2 level goes right down and it only comes back up when the bevacizumab stops controlling the patient's blood vessels. Now, so far, We've obtained preliminary data for this in uh, ovarian cancer, bowel cancer, and bile duct cancer. And as a result of this, Cancer Research UK has supported us in a program called Valtive, where we will take, we will remeasure this in a large group of patients, um, and uh, uh, over the next uh, one to two years, prior to really starting to take this into the NHS to support giving decisions to support doctors and their patients in making decisions about bevacizumab. What we're saying is we, within a few weeks of starting bevacizumab, we can tell whether this drug is working. So if it's not working, obviously we can stop it. And if it is working, we can keep going for as long as it puts the brakes on the tumor. Now we did this study by um, marrying up test, the blood tests that measured the TI2 concentration in the patient's blood with what was going on inside the patient's tumor. We used an advanced form of MRI imaging to measure the blood vessels inside the patient's tumor. So if you can imagine this person's lying on their back had, the, the kidneys are just shown down at the bottom here and this is the patient's liver and we've used a false color map to demonstrate where the blood vessels were in the patient's tumor and as we gave the patient the anti-blood vessel drug and saw the reduction in the blood vessels inside the tumor so we were able to demonstrate also that the TI2 level went down and vice versa as well. So just to summarize what we're saying on this slide because this is really important we now know that we can use and reuse these VGF inhibitors with good effect in our patients. It's unrealistic to say that we're going to treat everybody all the time with these drugs because it's, they're, they're toxic, but they're potentially toxic and they are expensive as well. So we need to use them in the most effective way for our patients. So the way that we're developing this and trying to help the NHS is to develop and validate this simple blood test uh, that we can use that demonstrates within a few weeks of starting uh, the drug, whether the drug is actually working and hitting the blood vessels inside our patient's tumours uh, and when it stops working so that we can try and optimise the use of these drugs. 
Okay, so now I just need to do a rapid revision session, section on PARP inhibitors because I'm going to move on to combining results with PARP inhibitors and results with VGF inhibitors together uh, in a trial that was presented recently. And I know that many of you will know very well about PARP inhibitors, but I just need to, uh, in case there's anybody in the audience who doesn't uh, know the background about BRCA and PARP inhibitors, just go through that pretty quickly. So um, uh, what about PARP inhibitors? Many of you will know that the BRCA genes are inherited uh, in an abnormal way in what we call a BRCA gene mutation in about 15% of our patients with ovarian cancer. And a further 5%, they don't inherit it, but there's actually a gene abnormality inside the patient's tumor. Just remember, the cause of cancer, it's, cancer is actually a disease of genes. So inside the ovaries, there are cells and those ovarian cancer cells contain DNA, which is like the computer code, and cancer is a, is a disease of that computer code. And in 20% of patients, we're now saying that um, those, uh, those patients, in 20% of them, have a, a gene abnormality called a BRCA gene abnormality. And to remind you, there are two family syndromes, so this is the 15% the, the here. BRCA1 increases the risk of breast and ovarian cancer, so that affects women only, largely, and BRCA2 affects breast and ovarian and as well as prostate and pancreas. So men can be affected in the BRCA2 families as well. I'm oversimplifying it slightly, but roughly speaking, there's a 50% chance of children inheriting one of two of these genes uh, um, uh, fr uh, from a man or a woman, in fact. And if you inherit a gene, roughly speaking, there's about a 50% chance of developing a, a cancer, be it a breast or ovarian cancer. Now, um, the BRCA gene makes a protein that repairs DNA. And as I said, cancer is a disease of uh, genes. And what we now know is that in, in about 50% of ovarian cancers, there is defects, there's abnormal defects that are like BRCA. So just going back to the top, we're saying 15% of women inherit a BRCA gene, uh, a gene abnormality. Another five have um, a gene abnormalities inside the tumor uh, that happen just by chance. But a total of 50% so that's another 35% of patients have some defect inside their tumor cells that makes them like um, BRCA genes. And so uh, we call those HRD, which is, stands for homologous recombination deficiency. And all that, all that really means is this ladder that you can see on the left-hand side has defects on both sides of it and that, and, uh, 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 during replication, and that needs to be repaired. So what we're saying is that 50% of ovarian cancer have defects like BRCA, and we call those HRD. And it's important, and I'm going to explain why this is all important, because it, this HRD or BRCA-like behavior renders the tumors sensitive to PARP. So let's just revise that just quickly. If you imagine a normal cell, uh, roughly speaking, the, the cell has to try and maintain that computer code, the DNA, it, with, uh, with as great integrity as it possibly can, because only defects cause problems in our cells. And there, there are two, two systems that are of relevance here. There's the BRCA gene that, re, uh, uh, that repairs both sides of the DNA and the PARP gene that re repairs just one side of the DNA ladder. And they sort of back each other up. So uh, when both are in existence in a normal situation, the DNA is repaired. If you knock out the BRCA gene, so that can happen in patients who inherit a BRCA gene abnormality, PARP makes up for that defect. So, so long as the PARP system is, is, is working okay, the DNA will be repaired and it doesn't suffer any problems. On the other hand, in a patient who has a normal BRCA gene uh, and you give a, a PARP inhibitor, again, the, the BRCA gene uh, pro product makes up for the deficiency of PARP and so DNA is still repaired. But what we capitalize on in our treatment of our patients is that in a patient who has a BRCA gene abnormality, when we give a PARP inhibitor, they can no longer repair the DNA. And this leads to um, uh, what's called synthetic lethality. In other words, we're taking advantage of this genetic error, error inside the cancer cells to block the only repair system left to the cancer. And that's why PARP inhibitors work in our patients. Now, before I talk about the, the main uh, part, the reason I've gone back to PARP inhibitors, I wanted to just update you in case you didn't know the results of SOLO1, which was presented a few weeks ago at one of the European studies, uh, European conferences. So this is uh, an addition, if you like, to the main thrust of today's talk, but it's an important result and I just wanted to tell you about it. So SOLO1 was a study that was conducted a few years ago, in which 391 patients who had um, BRCA gene abnormalities, either they'd inherited it or it had developed in their tumor, and they had ovarian cancer that was controlled by surgery 
uh, or chemotherapy. And then they were randomized, those patients were randomly allocated either to receive two years of Olaparib or just placebo. Remember at this point when the study was conducted, we didn't know about PARP inhibitors, we didn't know about HRD, we were focusing in this study on the BRCA gene um, uh, abnormalities that were present in the tumor or which the patient had inherited. And the reason I'm telling you this is this, this is now the five-year update of, of the results of this study. And what we can see in the, in the arm of the patients who took placebo is that it was around about 15 months um, after taking part in the study before their tumor uh, misbehaved or progressed again. But on the elaparib arm, they still haven't reached the average survival. It's over five years. And so this dramatic improvement in overall survival, which in, um, in recurrence uh, free survival, is really having an impact on our patients. So this pertains to the first line treatment setting. In, in patients who are in the first line treatment, who have a BRCA gene abnormality, either in the tumor or uh, they've inherited it, there's a, 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 a major imperative that they should receive a laparib as maintenance therapy after first line treatment, because even five years out now, we still haven't reached the average uh, uh, recurrence free survival. And some of these women appear to uh, potentially be cured uh, 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 this far out. So this is, a, this is a really important result. But there are other patients, this only applies if you, if you remember to the 20% of patients who have a BRCA gene abnormality. So the question is, can we bring together the, um, the combination of PARP inhibitors and the VGF inhibitors in the first line setting. So in Paola 1, which again was updated again recently, this is 800 patients took part in this study, again with ovarian cancer and advanced ovarian cancer that have been controlled by surgery and chemotherapy. Now all the patients in the, in the control arm received Avastin, Bevacizumab, but in the experimental arm they had Bevacizumab supplemented by Olaparib. And the results showed that in the control arm, those treated with bevacizumab alone had 18 months um, before the illness misbehaved, whereas those treated with a combination had 26 months of benefit before the illness misbehaved. And in those who had, you remember I was talking on the previous slide about having gene defects that are like BRCA, this HRD, this extended to 37 months, so almost doubling that period before the illness misbehaved. So it's not quite as a, a profound as improvement as patients who have BRCA gene abnormalities, but that's a specific group of patients. In patients who appear to have biology that looks uh, like a BRCA gene abnormality, there is a significant improvement. And even um, in those who had just had some benefit alone, there was this uh, a significant improvement. The question that we have to face now is whether we should be using both of these drugs in the first line setting and what can we use subsequently. So let's combine these two ideas together. How should we be using these drugs in 2020 and beyond? Uh, I should say that this is not yet available. We're moving the, in this direction and hopefully uh, probably 2021 will start to develop some of these combinations, but we will need to encourage the NHS down these directions. Let's just start to combine the, 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 the concepts that I've been talking about over the last few uh, minutes. We have PARP inhibitors that look like they're additive when we add them together with VGF inhibitors. And we know from the previous study that we can use and reuse VGF inhibitors to our advantage. So let's look at how we should be treating our patients now. So we start off with surgery and chemotherapy, and then in the maintenance phase, in the first time we, this is in advanced cancer only, not in the early stage, like stage one, where it's just confined to the ovaries. In advanced cancer, we can bring together VGF inhibitors and PARP inhibitors. And I showed you on the previous slide that that controls and brings better control for our patients already. This also probably should not include the patients who have BRCA gene abnormalities because we know from the SOLO1 study that I showed you on the previous slide that they benefit so much from um, uh, the uh, uh, PARP inhibitors already. The next thing that happened around about uh, two years ago was a trial called Desktop3, which looked at the possibility of reusing surgery in, patient, in the certain select groups of patients. And what we now know is that surgery can be considered for patients who have recurrent ovarian cancer, but only if we're really sure that we can remove everything at the time of the operation. What we found out since uh, that study was uh, presented was that if you do an operation and, the and some of the illness is still left behind, then the patients don't benefit from it. But it's still, as oncologists, this is something that we consider for our patients when, the, when or if the illness comes back. But the important thing from the Italian study that I showed you is that we now need to consider whether we can use these VGF inhibitors again. We know that the trial supports using the, uh, uh, these um, 
drugs again and potentially we can use them and reuse them quite safely because they're, they're quite well tolerated and potentially we now have a, a marker a blood test that we can use tie 2 that we're going to start to develop for nhs to try and optimize the use of these drugs we are also uh, at the christie um, trying to develop treatment for one of the major complications of ovarian cancer which is um uh, bowel obstruction and some of you who, who have had ovarian cancer will recognize this as a problem. So one of the major problems that we see in um, ovarian cancer is, is the effect on the bowels and that's because the illness can form a coating around the outside of the bowels and so um, it can cause bowel symptoms as you can see on this x-ray where the, the patient's um, bowel is full of fluid and you can see these lines of fluid in the, in the person's abdomen and that can cause swelling in the person's abdomen, sickness and constipation. It's not, not nice. But despite this being a common problem for our patients, we're all very much aware that we don't have a standard treatment for dealing with bowel obstruction. And so we've put together the first protocol, the first trial, if you like, to try and address this before the patients develop fully um, blocked up bowels. We're trying to give them Taxol and also adding in a VGF inhibitor as well to try and capitalize on the fact that we, we can try and bring things under control and then keep it like that as well. So we're now completing a study in Manchester and a safety study and so far it looks it looks safe which is the main thing uh, that we were most concerned about to start with but potentially this is a really this is an important unmet need for our patients and because it's an unmet need um, and it's it's quite a symptomatic problem that we see for our ladies um, we're developing also in parallel um, one of what I think is the, one of the first units in the NHS called CAREGO which is to deal with the obstruction symptoms that we get in our, our patients and so we're appointing staff to try and specifically focus on optimizing patient management bringing together symptom control management um, we use intravenous feeding for our patients so that they can be at home as well and there's a whole load of different symptoms and treatment that we bring to our patients to try and um, sort out this problem or bypass it to, so that the patients can be as at home as, as quickly as possible so this is a new development that we're bringing through and hopefully what CBOC has, has finished, we'll be able to take that trial forwards uh, in, a, in a larger setting to try and develop a standard treatment that we can use for our patients in the future for um, dealing with bowel obstruction. Okay, so one of the issues that, uh, one of the questions that I often get in clinic is, can I have an immune treatment uh, and will it work for ovarian cancer? Roughly speaking, there are three parameters that we need to have present for immune drugs to work. These are that you need your cells that fight tumors, what we call lymphocytes, to be present in the tumor. And we know that they're present in ovarian cancer. And for years, there's been several papers that have shown that the higher the amount of lymphocytes or immune cells inside your tumor, the greater the benefit. The second thing is that um, the various molecules have been discovered that stop your immune system from reacting with different parts of your body. So in fact, this is a really important issue. You don't want your immune system to fight against your body. Yet, despite that, we know that there are some conditions, what we call autoimmune conditions, like rheumatoid arthritis or, or diabetes, for instance, where your immune system does start to fight uh, different parts of your body. And those autoimmune conditions can cause problems. But nature has desi designed systems to try and stop your immune system from reacting against itself. And in fact, they use those systems to try and stop cancer. Uh, 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 those systems are used by cancers to stop your immune system reacting against the cancer. Some of these are called PD-1 and PD-L1, and, and antibodies are being, uh, have been developed that block this mechanism to try and break what we call immune tolerance, to try and activate the immune system um, against the cancer. And this is the basis upon which nearly all immune drugs are currently working uh, in the clinic, breaking that tolerance through that system that I've described there. And again, this is present in our, in our patients' tumors as well. So these two, we've got a tick so far. We know that lymphocytes are present. We know that these mechanisms that block the immune system are there, and we could target them with, with the current generation of immune drugs. The problem is the third issue. For an immune system to work, we need that the immune system can detect new molecules to which uh, uh, it, it can then react. So for instance, in smoking, new molecules are formed by the tar from the smoking or in melanoma the sunlight damages the cells and causes new molecules to form against which the immune system can respond. Now the problem in ovarian cancer is that the genetic defect, if you remember I was saying that cancer is a disease of genes, the genetic defect in ovarian cancer does not result in new molecules, it just results in loads of copies of the same molecules as usual but just in a disordered way and this is the problem in ovarian cancer. 
so far, when we've used immune drugs just on their own in ovarian cancer, they've been disappointing. And that's largely, I think, because there aren't the new molecules against which the immune system can react. Why am I telling you all this? This is a talk about anti-blood anti vessel drugs, and that's right, it is. Because so far with these anti-blood vessel drugs, I've been talking about the impact of these drugs that they have on the blood vessel system and normalizing the blood vessel system. But over the last five, six years, it became apparent that the drugs that we were using to sort out the blood vessels have a profound effect on the immune system as well. What it's doing here is not necessarily important, but what it, what it, the, these drugs are activating the immune system. And because of that, people, a, a number of companies have started to combine immune drugs with VGF inhibitors to say, can we augment the uh, response to immune therapy by adding in a VGF inhibitor? And summarizing multiple trials now, we've had, as a result of this strategy of combining VGF inhibitors and immune drugs together, we've improved the outlook in kidney, liver, lung, and womb cancer. But sadly, just a few weeks ago, the first ovarian trial was presented looking at this and it didn't work. So souping up the immune system with a VGF inhibitor uh, was not sufficient to overcome this lack of new molecules that are present in ovarian cancer. And that's unfortunately a negative trial that's been reported. So the last few slides have been a, a very, perhaps a long-winded way of saying that um, VGF inhibitors, which we've been using as anti-blood vessel drugs and which do offer advantages to our patients, have been tested to see whether they could augment the immune response with immune drugs in ovarian cancer to try and really break tolerance to ovarian cancer, but it's not worked, at least in this first clinical trial. So um, AstraZeneca and possibly other groups have started to say, well, how about if we combine all our drugs together? So they now combined immune drugs, VGF inhibitors, as shown here, and PARP inhibitors as well, because PARP inhibitors, if you remember, are a smart form of chemotherapy in, in a way, they will cause some DNA damage and these might create new molecules themselves. And in fact, just at the start of this, it starts to look like this may have some activity. But the problem is when you start, to, this is really very early, it's, it's nowhere near coming to market, this sort of treatment. The problem is that these are three active treatments that you're giving to the patient and you don't know that any one of these three might be responsible for a patient's illness responding. So you might come back to me and say, well, I don't really care, just give me the whole lot. And the reason that is a problem is because immune drugs cost about £100,000 a year, VGF inhibitors are about 25000 a year, and PARP inhibitors are about 60000 a year. So you're talking about £200,000 per patient per year for treatment that is highly complex and will have side effects. So we really need to sort this out. We can't give everybody all of these drugs, even if it proved to be effective. And I don't think it's going to be like that. What we really need to understand is who benefits from which of these drugs and try and tailor it to those patients, just in the same way as we're using TIE2 to optimize VGF inhibitors. And now we're using um, uh, uh, BRCA gene testing or HRD testing to optimize whom to give PARP inhibitors to, because we know that that group benefits. So, just in conclusion, we've said that angiogenesis and VGF inhibitors are useful at multiple times. We can now use and reuse them. But the really important thing from the NHS point of view is that this drug, which was quite expensive up until a few years ago, is now being cut down in price by 75%. We, that's um, uh, the, the medics and the patients, I think as well, need to encourage the NHS to allow use and reuse because we knew these drugs are effective. They're not expensive anymore, so we need to be able to try and reuse them. And we're developing TIE2 as a simple test that we can use to try and optimize the use of these drugs for our patients. We know that the combination with PARP inhibitors of VGF inhibitors is active and it's been proven in a number of different trials, some of which I haven't had time to mention today. But at the moment, it looks like using and reusing PARP inhibitors doesn't necessarily work. It does work once, reusing them, it's not clear that that's going to be a, a benefit. And that is because it, a bit like chemotherapy, it, it looks like resistance is starting to become a, a factor with PARP inhibitors once you use them. So the question then is, it, we now know from the first line study that combining a PARP inhibitor with a VGF inhibitor is effective, but will we be better off if we can only use PARP inhibitors once, will we be better off using them uh, again later on? And we don't know the question to this. Should we use VGF inhibitors first, then PARP inhibitors second? We don't know the answer to these questions about how to best to use it, but we do know that we can use and reuse the, uh, drugs like bevacizumab safely and effectively. So far, unfortunately, the immune oncology combinations are, are not effective. So we keep an eye on this. Triple drug therapy, as I said on the previous slide, 
looks like it may have some activity, but it's impossibly expensive. I just wanted to leave you now, the last concept really, is the direction of travel that I think we're going in now as we start to treat our patients. So if you just imagine a cancer which is ma made up, oops, made up of cancer cells shown as gray ovals and blood vessels which are shown as these pink tubes here. We now have um, what we call biomarkers or simple tests that we can use to track the behavior of each of these components here. We know that cancer cells secrete CA125 and we can measure that every time we, we, we see our patients. We also are developing and validating a simple blood vessel test as well called TIE2. And in our work so far, we can now tell um, whether it's the blood vessels that are starting to take off and misbehave or whether the tumor cells are starting to take off and, and, and which needs to be the target. And this is relevant because you can start to monitor different compartments, if you like, inside the patient's tumor using different tests. And so in the future, the direction of travel, I think, that we're going in with this sort of work is to say, let's measure these on a regular basis. They're, these tests are not expensive. We can measure them every two or three weeks in our clinic and understand which bit of the patient's tumor is misbehaving. And by understanding that, say, for instance, that the blood vessels are starting to misbehave, and we can tell that because the TI2 level starts to increase again, having been under good control for some time, we can then br bring in the next generation of anti-blood vessel drugs that would stop this tumor starting to establish itself and starting to grow again. So those of you in the audience who've had ovarian cancer will know that we track what's going on through scans, and we look for sc the scan and say nothing's growing, there's no problem. But we now have the opportunity to start to measure things that are happening before we ever see anything on the scan. We can track the TIE2 and track CA125, look for changes that are happening and try and change the way that we're treating cancer into a chronic illness. In other words, we don't wait for things to deteriorate so that we can see them on scans and instead try and intervene and change the behaviour of cancer into a chronic but much more stable condition. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you ever so much, Gordon. That was really interesting. We've had lots of questions come in. Um, I don't know that we'll have time to get through them all, everyone. We will try and get through as many as possible. Um, and if not, then we'll, we'll follow up with um, any outstanding answers in an email. Um, so we'll make a start. Let's go. So the first one is, um, why do we stop PARP inhibitors after two years? So the that the, the restriction to two years with um, first line PARP inhibitors is because uh, there are side effects of PARP inhibitors that are rare but significant. So we know, for instance, there's a proportion of ladies with um, ovarian cancer in the first line setting where the illness will be potentially cured by first line therapy. Now, PARP inhibitors rarely have uh, significant side effects and when you signed your consent form the doctors will have said to you um, that there is a small chance that the illness will cause what's called a precancerous change in your bone marrow or cancer of the bone marrow and those two things are called myelodysplasia or cancer of the bone marrow is also called leukemia so when you're treating a person in the first line setting there is a proportion of patients where the illness doesn't come back again and if that's the case you don't you, um, particularly if you're improving that with, with the PARP inhibitor, you don't want to cause damage or harm to the person by continuing on the drugs forever. And that's the main issue with these drugs. There are some long-term side effects. So just to list them, pneumonitis potentially, which is inflammation of the lungs, myelodysplasia, which is precancerous change in the bone marrow, or leukemia. These are very rare events. And in the context, if the illness has come back once, and we know that it can come back again, Though in that sort of setting, then it's perfectly justified to say, yes, yes, there might be a problem with myelodysplasia. It's unusual, but it's offset by the advantage of the PARP inhibitors. But in the first line setting where a person may potentially be cured, giving them more than two years runs the risk that they may start to get the long term side effects or damage from the PARP inhibitors. And as a result of that, they, um, they, you know, they, their lives may be affected. Now, having said that, if you look at the trial data, it's two years if you have no sign of the of residual tumour. In patients who have residual tumour visible at the end of two years, but it's stable, it's being controlled, the trial design, and I think the NHS licensing allows you to continue longer. So it's a quite an important distinction. In patients where they've got nothing on the scan at the end of two years, uh, or the CA1, and the CA125 is normal, there's a potential for that patient to be cured, in which case you don't want to give, expose them to long-term 
PARP inhibitors because they, they may get the long-term side effects. If patients have residual tumor uh, on, the, uh, on, uh, on the scan, then the NHS licensing and agreement allows you to continue for longer. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, uh, where are we? Um, when you're tested for the BRCA gene, are you tested for HRD as well? No, so, right, so uh, the BRCA, BRCA is the most extreme version of HRD, which is so homologous recombination deficiency is a sort of double, it's both sides of the ladder of DNA being repaired. And the most extreme example, the most sensitive example in terms of uh, sensitivity to PARP inhibitors is BRCA, which is where all of this started from. So BRCA gene abnormalities are an example of HRD. Where the NHS hasn't taken this on yet, because it's not a perfect science, is there is a, there is a testing which is licensed in the US, um, uh, which is uh, made by a company called Myriad, for instance, which is one of the companies that carries out HRD testing. And it can score your tumor, uh, of which about 50% of tumors are uh, scored as HRD. And that tends to correlate with benefit from PARP inhibitors, but it's not a perfect science. Where, where we're waiting now is to see, uh, is to see whether, um, as we develop the combinations like the PARP inhibitors and the uh, bevacizumab combinations, whether the NHS will start to use these HRD tests. It's, they're not perfect, but it's the best that's available right now. And many academic groups are trying to improve on that. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, can you take a PARP inhibitor if you don't have a BRCA mutation? Yes. So, so what we're saying is, of the, if you take the, the most common type of um, ovarian cancer that we see, which is high-grade serous or high-grade endometrioid, those are the two most common types of ovarian cancer. In the advanced setting, advanced cancer setting, which is stage three or four, about 50% of patients will have HRD uh, abnormality. Now, uh, those patients are the ones that mostly benefit. Having said that, in the NHS, if you have a tumour that benefits, so this is recurrent tumour, if it benefits from a platinum chemotherapy, those patients uh, can, get, can access a PARP inhibitor. And the first line setting, the only access at the moment that we have is a laparib through BRCA only. Um, that's the only line, first line setting. In a recurrent disease setting, patients who have illness that responds to platinum be it, be it BRCA or non-BRCA, can access PARP inhibitors through the NHS. How can, how can drugs for VEGF POPs... Uh, sorry, hold on, I'm just going to have to work this question out. Right, are the, are the drugs um, that are targeting, um, so VEGF and POPs, are they useful in low grade? And is HRD found in low grade? How are we moving forward with treatments for low grade? Right, so, so low grade is biologically completely different illness. Having said that, we know from past publications that the VEGF inhibitors work, and they actually work reasonably well, but they're unfortunately not available on, on the NHS. But it's a, it's a rare illness, but actually that's quite a useful point. Because it's biologically completely different and has different genetic abnormalities from high grade, there's no rationale to use PARP inhibitors. So VGF inhibitors are active, but not currently available on the NHS, I'm afraid. Um, if bevacizumab is known to be so effective, why are there certain criteria to access it? And why is it not available on the NHS to all ovarian cancer patients who are likely to benefit? So uh, if you remember at the beginning, I was, I was saying, first of all, that if a tumour is microscopic, it doesn't have its own blood supply, it doesn't, it, there's no point in giving um, an anti-blood vessel drug. So if you have stage one or two ovarian cancer, there's no reason to suspect that you would actually benefit from it because it only works in the advanced tumour setting. So the settings that we use it in are stage three or four ovarian cancer with more than one centimetre of residual tumour, or where we give chemotherapy first, what we call the neoadjuvant approach. Those are the two settings where we, tend, where we use it on the NHS. Um, uh, and those are the appropriate because those were identified in, in several trials as being the group that mainly benefit from it. Um, typically, if, if you have illness that's visible on the scan, that would probably be enough to justify it, but really, uh, when, sorry, post-operatively, I'm, I'm saying. But there are specific NHS criteria that are probably correct in the first line setting. Where we need to try and encourage the NHS now, particularly as we're now 
um, the price of the, the bevacizumab has been reduced by so much that it's come up because it's come off patent. We now try, need to try and make it available for use and reuse. And in Scotland, I think I understand correctly that in Scotland, they, they use bevacizumab or have been using in the past in the platinum resistant setting um, rather than the, the first line setting. Where we need to change things, ideally, what I've shown today is where we should would hopefully be going um, with uh, these combinations uh, 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 with this drug in the future. In other words, you can use and reuse it in the same way that we use platinum and reuse platinum. Um, is CA125 accurate when used to monitor during bevacizumab maintenance therapy? Uh, it's quite it's quite accurate, but if you remember back, there was a trial that we did years ago um, called OVO5, which looked at the way the way that um, CA125 related to what was going on on the scans, and we saw that CA125 can sometimes go up an average of three or four months before we actually see anything on the scan, uh, and so CA125 changes can predate what's going on on the on the scan. The other thing that we see with our patients on bevacizumab. Uh, with regard to CA125 is it looks like it puts the brakes on the tumour, which is exactly what I'm showing on that cartoon in a way, but you're starving the tumour of oxygen and nutrients and you really slow down the progression of the tumour. So as we monitor our patients, the CA125 can be slowly increasing, but the scans don't really show much of a change because the brakes are on the tumour. So CA125 is, is useful, but it, it, it gives us a direction of change. It tells us whether the tumour is behaving itself or, or not but it doesn't tell us when we should change course. Um, and so obviously we're trying to augment that by developing specific blood tests for blood vessel markers as well. But at present, we base our, our uh, management on what does the scan show and how does the person, how does the patient feel? And, uh, about, uh, and does she have any symptoms? We base it on, on clinical and radiological parameters at, at the moment. And we've probably got time for one more question. So I'm really sorry to everyone whose questions we haven't got to yet, but we will follow up with an email. Um, someone else saying, when do you think the TIE 2 test will be available? It's probably going to be about three years because um, we have to complete a, what we call the CRUK biomarker roadmap, which is a, a, a number of steps to get it into the NHS. Because obviously we don't want to, the, the whole point of this is to, is to prove that it works so that we're not depriving anybody of effective treatment. We don't want to stop treatment early if, you know, it, by mistake, if you like, by saying that well, TIE2 tie hasn't worked, therefore we should stop your treatment. Nobody wants to do that. So we've got to be very careful about what we're doing. But it, on the basis that we've now shown it works in three different tumour types and two different classes of VGF inhibitor, it looks good, but that's why we're, we're completing the last steps of the Cancer Research UK uh, biomarker roadmap to make sure that we're never going to deprive anybody of effective treatment. Great. Thank you ever so much, Gordon. And I think um, you know, the, the response in terms of how many questions we've had coming uh, to show how, how interesting and useful this talk has been for everyone. So thank you ever so much for your time. Thank you very much for inviting me.